Hello, and welcome back to Bomb Chew. I'm Austin. And I'm Chris. And today we'll be taking a look at the Humble Choice Bundle from April 2020. No matter where you are, we hope you're staying safe from the health crisis going on around us. It's never been a better time to stay inside and play video games. So let's see if Humble brought us something good to keep us busy for a while. This month, alongside the Humble exclusive, we're also being given access to a demo for Ring of Pain. Ring of Pain is a roguelite, card game based dungeon crawler developed by Twice Different and Simon Boxer. Ring of Pain has your character making their way through a sort of randomly generated dungeon, collecting items and various power-ups to help them defeat enemies and survive the journey ahead. These dungeons aren't traditional level layouts, but instead are randomly selected cards. Each of the cards is laid out in a ring, and the player may choose which way around it they wish to go. Being able to see the cards that are behind the ones in front allow you to get a glimpse of what's coming ahead, and try to plan for the easiest route, or the route that leads to the most powerful items. The gameplay seems fairly simple, as combat breaks down to a simple whose attack number is bigger kind of encounter, but it does help to keep things from getting too bogged down, and it keeps the momentum going forward as well. With my first run through the game, there didn't seem to be too much strategy involved, as most of the creatures I encountered were fairly weak, and I had also come across some pretty strong equipment as well. However, the demo does cut off your run pretty early. Hopefully this means there's a lot more depth under the surface than what could be seen in the demo. While I wasn't interested in it at first glance, the demo for Ring of Pain makes the game seem like a fairly fun and interesting take on the roguelite dungeon crawler genre, even if it does seem pretty basic. I might have to keep my eye on this game once it has a full release. This most humble original is Divinoids. This plays a lot like a more modern version of Rampage, though with retro-style visuals. You take control of one of three monsters, each with different abilities, and you set out to destroy the planet before its defense shield catches up to you. You walk around in a top-down overworld where time passes only when you move. Touch an enemy or a city, and you'll begin a side-scrolling encounter where you need to destroy everything. In this mode, you'll have a few different attacks and abilities, but you can also transform. Each monster's two forms are good at different things. Like the main monster I played as was easier to maneuver in base form, but transformed, I was faster and could do way more damage, but I felt a lot less in control of where I was going. Oh yeah, each form also has an ultimate move, which is bonkers. In each encounter, you'll want to take down all the enemies or destroy all the buildings. Doing so will lower the planet's resources, slowing down the defense shield and granting you bonuses. Get the resources down enough and the planet will be doomed. Head to your spaceship and move on to the next planet you want to conquer. The planets get tougher as you go, with environmental effects that mess with both you and your enemies. This one is really fun, and it has co-op which seems like it would be a great fit. If you've been itching for some more Rampage, this is a great modern option. Capitalism 2 is a business simulation game by developer Enlight and published by Ubisoft back in 2001. Capitalism is sort of similar to SimCity, but with the focus entirely on the business side of the city. Players construct different type of businesses, factories, and other buildings in order to help grow their corporation. Details get very granular, with things like supply chain, demand, production costs, and manufacturing discounts all coming into play when trying to maximize your profits. However, this is a game from 2001, so this information isn't presented in the most pleasing or intuitive of ways. Lots of tutorials are inbound for this game, and expect to do at least some supplemental reading if you want to get good. I wouldn't say Capitalism 2 is a bad game, as it reviewed fairly well for the time, and even just a cursory glance at the deep systems at play show there's a lot going on under the surface. However, it's still a PC simulation game from 2001, and it definitely shows. The game is just not great to look at, with every menu being filled with big, unhelpfully designed buttons taking the place of simple, more universally accepted icons, or just plain text that you might expect in a more modern game. Tutorials are dense and hard to get through, and just guessing your way through levels is a good way to end up going broke or not reaching your sales goal in time. It's unfair to hold some of these criticisms against the game, as it's a relic from almost 20 years ago, but without the nostalgia factor or a deep love for classic simulation games, it's hard to recommend anyone use one of their picks on Capitalism 2. While I'm sure the game is loved by old school fans of the series or that genre, it's just not for me, and I won't be playing anymore. Shopkeep 2 
or sorry, according to the store page, the full title of this game is Shopkeep 2 Online Co-op Open World First Person Resource Management RPG. If you've been watching for a long time, I covered the original Shopkeep almost three years ago when it was included in the June 2017 Humble Monthly Bundle. It was awful and one of the worst games I've ever gotten in a monthly bundle, ever. It was an early access game that was declared to be done when it was definitely not done. The developer then decided to work on a sequel, again in early access, and has once again determined that this game is done. Well, I can tell you this is much more playable than the original Shopkeep, but this sequel is in desperate need of polish. And when you get past the annoying tutorials, bad graphics and sound, and the terrible UI, at its core, Shopkeep 2 is not a fun game. Where do I begin? You open up to a screen telling you that the game is out of early access, but that development will continue. The last patch with any notes was six months ago, and the community believes that the game has been abandoned much like the first. But hey, the game is out of early access, so there's at least a complete game here, right? You need to create a character and... Oh my god, why is it so ugly? Why is one of the options to change what bra to wear? Why is this one of the bra choices? After you finish making your monstrosity of a character, you must complete the tutorial, which at the very least, there is a tutorial, which is more than I can say for the previous game. You're guided by this guy who makes a horrible noise every time he talks to you, and whatever he's saying, it's the most important thing ever, so you need to see it all the time. Pausing the game to change your options? Yeah, his tutorial keeps floating over the options screen. You'll learn about sweeping up messes in your shop, setting up and repairing displays, and ordering items. Oh, and opening your shop. The tutorial tells you to open the shop three different times, and each time you try, it tells you how dumb you are for not doing some other step first that the game doesn't tell you until you attempt to open the store. But after a bit, the tutorial is over and you can play for real. Remember in the first game how you couldn't jump and every time you'd press space, it would tell you that you couldn't jump? Well, despite being able to sprint in the tutorial, sprinting is the new jumping when you start the real game. You need to buy the sprint skill, which costs nothing by the way. God forbid you just start with basic movement options. You go set up your shop, people start buying, and hey, where's the money? Well, anytime something is sold in your shop, it goes to the bank, and you have to go and manually withdraw your money if you want it. While you're there, you can pay taxes on what you sold. Yeah, taxes. That's not automated by the bank, which somehow takes your money from sales at your store. Don't pay your taxes too many times and you'll be shut down. You can optionally raise taxes, which is really weird to me. Higher taxes means you make less money, but when you pay a certain amount of taxes, the town will get upgrades. It's not a very good system, and even with raised taxes, it's a grind to unlock anything with taxes. Having an option to invest money to improve the town would feel a lot better. Or hell, automatically tax the shop sales. But having to keep making trips to the bank to get your money and make sure you keep up with your taxes is a drag. Oh, and check this out, the mirror is broken. There was a mirror in the first game with an absolutely dreadful reflection, so instead of making it better, the developer just decided to break it as a joke. Once you're established, you'll find you want to make trips out of your shop quite often to go to the bank or to get more stuff. You can even go sell the villagers directly. But while you're gone, customers will steal your goods and trash your store. So you are constantly encouraged to leave, but you're also punished for doing so. There is combat in the game apparently, but you have to pay a buttload in taxes to unlock the gate to the outside world where the monsters are. So I have no idea what it's like, and the game isn't fun enough for me to bother sticking around long enough to find out. Oh, and hey, check it out, it has loot boxes with ugly cosmetic items you can buy and sell on the Steam Marketplace, which the developer takes a cut from. There is multiplayer, but I can't think of a single friend I'd want to put through the hell that is Shopkeep 2. I'd recommend this game to the two people who left comments defending the first game in my June 2017 review. If y'all like that game, you just may love this one. Everyone else, stay far away. The Bard's Tale 4 Director's Cut is a first-person party-based dungeon crawler RPG. It may be called Bard's Tale, but by no means are you required to play as a bard. You can create your very own character at the start, choosing your class, race, background, and skills. I went ahead and chose a bard because I wanted the authentic experience, and was surprised to find out that only about a fifth of Steam players had ever created a bard as their starting character. Unlike the old games from the 80s, you can freely move and look around and are no longer locked to grid-based movement. Well, sort of. 
combat is on a 4x4 grid. I guess let's talk about combat. As a bard, one of the main mechanics for me was getting drunk, and drunkenness was handled in a fun way. The more drunk the bard is, the stronger her spells are. Get more drunk points than intelligence points, and you get one turn of enhanced strength before you pass out. There were some really nice benefits to getting drunk, like I could place a shield on an ally, and if it broke, they would get healed. This saved me a ton on healing items, and ironically, getting drunk is free in this game. Your party shares a set of opportunity points, which they can use to perform actions before ending the turn and letting the enemy go. I like this a lot more than each character taking their turns separately, as you don't have to deal with timing issues when trying to synergize with teammates. Skills are enjoyable to use and encourage each character to play their role instead of just spamming attack. Within dungeons, there is some light puzzling in the form of these gear locks, which require a little manipulation to solve. I'd say the main beef I have with this game is that, at moments, it feels like a technically strong game with good production values, and then it does a close-up on a character's face or plays a kind of janky cutscene, and it suddenly feels like the exact opposite. Low budget and in need of a little more time in the oven. Mechanically, it's fun though, so if you like dungeon crawlers and you're okay with turn-based combat, you may want to give this a try. I found myself having fun with the combat despite not being much of a turn-based guy. That said, if you don't find yourself having time for a lot of RPGs and you can only play a few each year, I wouldn't suggest making this one of the handful you play this year. Of note, this game comes with a free copy of the Bard's Tale Trilogy, which is a remastered version of the original three games. They've had some nice modern touches added to them, but you can also play in Legacy mode to remove some of the streamlined features. Be warned though, these are very old-style dungeon crawlers which appeal to a pretty niche audience these days. Truberbrook is a sci-fi point-and-click adventure game set in 1960s Germany. I had some very mixed feelings about this game, both good and bad, so let's tackle what I liked first. The music, the atmosphere, and the visuals are wonderful. This game has such a vibe, and it carried me a lot farther than I would have gone with the game otherwise. The starry sky over a dimly lit gas station, this gorgeous lake, all with some really fitting tunes. Mm. That said, as someone who hasn't had a lot of great experiences with point-and-click games outside of Telltale's offerings, I had some annoyances with some of the puzzles, especially when the story started to get more interesting and I found myself blocked by several puzzles strewn across a number of areas that I'd need to deal with before I could get anywhere else. Interacting with an object will bring up a wheel to let you look at it, use your hands on it, use an item on it, or talk to it, with irrelevant options disabled. This can be inconsistent, though. I often really don't care for flavor text in games like this. So if I wasn't that interested in an item and it just had a look at it option, I'd just ignore it. Well, some objects you have to look at before you get the option to interact with them. On the plus side, when you can use an item on something, it will only show you certain items to choose from, instead of letting you try out all your items wondering if the solution to a puzzle is something insane. However, a lot of the time, spots where it will let you try to use an item have no items you can successfully use there, so I don't really understand why the option is grayed out on some objects, but not on others. If you like point-and-click adventure games, or even can generally tolerate them, the vibe in this game is excellent, and the story seems like it could go somewhere really interesting. Pass on this for sure if point-and-clicks aren't your thing, because this game will not change your mind. Turok 2 Seeds of Evil is a first-person shooter developed by Iguana Entertainment and first published back in 1998. Turok 2 puts players in the shoes of a new Turok, who is summoned through a portal by some kind of alien and is tasked with taking out other powerful aliens, dinosaurs, and various monsters. Gameplay mostly follows the same formula as the first one, with players taking out enemies, collecting power-ups, and finding keys to unlock other levels. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is definitely improved over the first entry, with movement feeling a bit more natural and fluid, and enemies do a much better job of moving around the map and trying to take out Turok. The game also adds some in-game objective markers, which makes finding your way around the levels a bit easier. However, not all of your objectives are marked, so chances are you'll still end up a little bit lost when trying to rely on memory or the substandard map overlay. The story of Turok 2 still isn't a strong point, but it does a better job than the first of preventing what story there is to the player through simplistic cutscenes and voice dialogue. Turok 2 also features a multiplayer mode, and, well, I guess it's there. If you really want to, you can hop online and play some classic deathmatch-style modes against other players. And it shouldn't come as a shock, but there's not really much of a player base for Turok 2. However, I did manage to find a room with two other people in it and mess around for a bit. 
The variety of guns is nice, and the levels are obviously pretty simple, but there's something still fun about those classic Quake-era multiplayer shooters. Turok 2 isn't for everyone, just like Turok in the last month's bundle. However, if you gave Turok a chance and found yourself having even a little bit of fun, you'll find more of the same charm here with enough improvements to make the experience even more enjoyable. Driftland The Magic Revival is a real-time strategy game developed and published by Star Drifters in 2019. Driftland seems to take inspiration from games like Warcraft 3, with a touch of Age of Empires in there as well. Players can construct different buildings, with some focused on resource gathering, others on upgrading civilians and more military-focused units. Each campaign map starts with a small base, and you're usually tasked with expanding alongside a few other tasks, such as taking out certain enemies or finding a hidden relic on the map. Players won't be tasked with controlling individual units, with them instead mostly taking control of some kind of powerful wizard. Alongside selecting areas of the map to explore and enemies for your units to encounter, players can also cast various spells and abilities. Some of these are more defensive in nature, such as allowing you to move the position of various floating islands to help you expand your empire. Others are more offensive, such as allowing you to blast opponents with fire. The variety of abilities available to the player help to spice up the gameplay quite a bit, which desperately needs something to keep it going. The hands-off nature of commanding your units means you spend a lot of time staring at the battlefield, waiting for resources to be gathered and parts of the map to be explored, with not a lot to do in the meantime. While I'm sure the later missions will get at least a little bit more complex, it feels hard to justify the initial time investment when the beginning is so bare-bones and just plain boring. The barrier to entry for this game is pretty low as far as RTS games go, but there's just not enough going on here for me to keep my interest. If you're a fan of RTS light games, you might find something here to enjoy, but for me and I'd imagine for a lot of other people, this one's going to be a hard pass. Raiden 5 is a vertical shoot-em-up game developed by Moss and originally released in 2016, with the director's cut releasing on PC in 2017. Raiden 5 has you taking control of one of three ships, outfitting it with various lasers and weapons, and taking on wave after wave of enemy ship as you blast your way toward the end-level boss. There's some kind of a story here, with mission briefings and dialogue from your crew during the missions as well. I couldn't really tell you what the story's about. There's some real mecha anime levels of drama going on, but I don't really play Raiden or games of that ilk for the story. For me, the shoot 'em up genre is about Twitch-based bullet dodging as you collect upgrades and blast your way through wave after wave of enemy, and Raiden definitely delivers on that front. I used to consider myself a somewhat hardcore fan of these type of games, with me having previously conquered Ikaruga and even a few of the less insane Toho games. However, jumping into Raiden 5 really kicked my ass at first. Dodging bullets is tough, and if you aren't a series or genre vet, expect to die a lot. However, Raiden 5 is incredibly forgiving on the normal difficulty levels. Each death is more a blow to your ego than anything else, as hitting start simply allows you to continue from where you died, complete with all your power-ups intact. This makes Raiden 5 a great entry point for newcomers to the genre, as well as a series staple for veteran fans alike. Overall, Raiden 5 is incredibly published, and delivers top-notch shoot-'em-up gameplay to modern audiences. I can't wait to put at least a little bit more time into it. Coming alongside Opus Magnum is Molex Sintes, also from Zactronics. This game has you creating chemical compounds, and while it technically is about automation, it involves a lot more chemistry than the other Zactronics games we've covered. You have a grid on which you can place predefined molecules, and you have six devices you can use to manipulate the atoms on the board. You want to create a molecule that matches the goal of the puzzle, and you want to be able to create it repeatedly to show that you have an automated solution. You can push atoms together, pull them apart, rotate them, remove them, add and remove hydrogen, or push some hydrogen to another atom. You'll be making and breaking bonds, and as always, being graded on your efficiency with puzzles that very quickly ramp up in difficulty. Like Opus Magnum, you don't do any coding, and you just use pictured tiles and a timeline for your six devices. It's a bit easier because you only have so many devices and compounds to work with, but you're also having to deal with chemistry, which will require some trial and error if you haven't dealt much with chemistry or haven't dealt with it in a long time like me. I was having fun with this up until I reached a puzzle not far into the game where I could tell what the game wanted me to do, but I absolutely did not want to deal with automating it or dealing with it as a normal mechanic for the rest of the game. So this is the first Zactronics game that I'm not that into. Just like Opus Magnum, pass on this if you aren't into puzzle games, but as for who I'd recommend this one to, I think I'd have to leave it up to you as the viewer to make a judgement call for yourself if this looks fun to you.
Opus Magnum is another game from developer Zagtronics, who brought us Exapunks, Shenzhen IO, and a number of other games in the past few Humble Choice bundles. In this game, you're an alchemical engineer, and you have to use your transmutation engine to automate the creation of compounds. That's all fancy speak for make a contraption that puts the correct colored tiles into a delivery box. If you were turned off by some of the other games from this developer, well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that there is no coding in this game. You create instructions for automating your machine with these simple tiles that get placed on a timeline, and they're really easy to work with. The bad news is that the puzzles are entirely freeform, so if you like to have constraints to help guide you to a solution, you are going to have to do it all by yourself. And just like other Zactronics games, you get graded on efficiency for your solution. There's no big manual you have to read for this one, it just gives you a proper tutorial. But after the tutorial is over, it ramps up in difficulty pretty quickly. I was not coming up with the most efficient solutions, but I was certainly having fun figuring things out and coming up with some kind of janky ways to solve some of my problems. This one's really easy to recommend if you liked the other Zactronics puzzle games we've gotten in the past few bundles, or if you like programming and automation in general. Pass on it if you don't like puzzle games, because these are like mega puzzle games. This is The Police 2 is a police department strategy sim game from developer Weappy Studios and released in 2018. The story seems to follow from the end of the first, with disgraced police chief Jack Boyd being caught up in a drug bust in the town of Sharpwood. Before long, he's dragged back into helping manage the police station while trying to clear his name of the events from the previous game. I hope you like the story because man, this game just barfs story all over the player and it never stops. The beginning of the game is 95% story and cutscenes, with very brief interludes of tutorials showing off some of the systems that play in the game. For the entire first hour that I played this game, I was treated to badly voiced dialogue, a story I can't connect with on more than a surface level, and plot points and scenes that seem to serve little to zero relevance to anything that's going on. One of the bad guy cops who harasses the main character at the beginning of the game has some of the most laughably written and acted dialogue I've seen in a long time. His voice acting is straight out of the Nicolas Cage School of Subtlety, and features stereotypical quote-unquote crazy cop lines that would even make rigs from Lethal Weapon blush. After about an hour and a half of this quality of storytelling, I started skipping cutscenes in a desperate attempt to get to the gameplay. Much like the first, you're tasked with managing a roster of police officers, all with varying personalities, skill sets, equipment, and other hidden attributes and quirks. As the day goes on, you'll get calls for various situations that require police intervention. You'll choose what officers you want to send out on these calls, and you'll need to make sure the officers you send have relevant skills that might help solve the problem at hand. Along with these regular calls, you'll also send officers to investigate more long-term crimes, such as murder cases where the suspect is unknown or has already fled the scene. As you investigate these cases, you'll be given more and more clues and details about the crime. Once you think you have enough pieces to solve the puzzle, you can name a suspect and place them under arrest. Overall, the actual gameplay of This Is The Police 2 is a lot of fun. Trying to manage the different personalities and skill sets of your officers is challenging but not too stressful, and successfully juggling all of your officers, calls, and cases is very satisfying. Unfortunately, the game seems to be bogged down by a lot of mediocre storytelling, especially at the beginning. If you can manage to get into the story, or don't mind skipping it just to get to the police sim game at the core, there's a lot of fun to be had with This Is The Police 2. Grease is an atmospheric platform adventure game with some absolutely breathtaking hand-drawn artwork. You play as Grease, a young girl who's dealing with some sort of trauma and trying to put the pieces of her life back together. She's lost her voice and the world around her is devoid of color. As you work through things, you start to bring beautiful color back into the world, and your dress gains abilities to help you cope with the rough environments and solve puzzles. As far as mechanics go, this isn't an overly complex game, and its puzzles aren't super difficult to solve, but it's also not just a side-scrolling walking simulator. It's a beautiful audio-visual experience, and if it looks interesting to you at all, you should play it. Excellent for people who like the idea of video games as art, but pass on it if you get easily bored without a lot of action in your games. Hitman 2 is a stealth elimination game developed in 2018 by IO Interactive. Hitman 2 puts players in the tailored suit of Agent 47, who is once again tasked with taking out a variety of targets however he sees fit. There's an underlying story that connects all of your missions, which seems to have something to do with someone who supposedly knows all about 47's past. 
However, I've never really dug deep into the series, so most of the story stuff is flying right over my head. Despite this, the story is still interesting on a surface level. Choosing a level in Target gives you a backstory on each person you're trying to take out, offering a little background material to make you feel less guilty about the possibly hilarious ways you're about to kill them. The basic gameplay loop has you getting a briefing on a target or targets, a list of some side stories that can lead to assassination opportunities, and what gear you want to try and smuggle onto the site. After that, the entire level is your sandbox, and you can approach each kill however you want. Do you want to take a chance and just go straight at your target? You can do that, but it'll be quite hard. Or you can disguise yourself as a guy in a mascot costume trying to blackmail the target with sensitive information in order to get close to them. Or maybe you feel like tinkering with the high-end race car so they end up crashing during the big race. Either way, the choice is yours, and it's what makes Hitman 2 such a unique and entertaining experience. While I'm not very good at the game, as evidenced by the fact that the majority of my kills came from throwing cans of tomato sauce at people, the ability to save and load from any point gives you the freedom to experiment without any punishment, at least on the lower difficulties. Sure, it can feel like you're cheating a bit when you're able to save and load constantly, but it also makes for a much more chill and entertaining experience. Fans who want a more hardcore Hitman experience can turn up the difficulty and limit their ability to save any time, so there's a little something there for everyone. Hitman is a series I've always wanted to get into, and Hitman 2 does a lot to ease new players into the series without diluting the experience too much for the hardcore fans. If the idea of carefully planning a series of traps to eliminate a target without anyone noticing, or even just running up behind them and chucking a can of soup or a brick at their head sounds like fun, you'll find something to enjoy with Hitman 2. I'll definitely be coming back to this one. So overall, how was this bundle? Hitman 2 was a big heavy hitter, and Grease brought the indie heat. It was great to get some more Zaktronics games if you're into those, and I wouldn't mind finishing out my collection in future months. Turok was almost universally a head-scratcher at best in last month's bundle, so including Turok 2 this month feels pretty tone-deaf on Humble's part. And they doubled down with Capitalism 2, which is from 2001. A good chunk of games also had mixed to mostly positive reviews, and while there are a few great games here, there were a lot to not be that excited about. If you're a classic or premium member with 9 or 10 choices, I'm sure it will feel like a lot of your choices this month are being wasted. There's an extra free game coming May 1st for people who stay subscribed this month, but there's no word on what that game will be, and it seems like a weak tactic to try and keep people subscribed during a down month. Humble is also giving this bundle out for free to new members who buy the current Health Crisis bundle that's running for $30, and that bundle is 100% benefiting charity so it may be that Humble had to pull some punches with the games we got in order to make that happen. That $30 bundle has a ton of really great games in it, so if you're on the fence about this month's Humble choice and there are a good number of games in that Health Crisis bundle that you don't have, or you just want to support charity and give some great games to your friends, I would recommend getting that bundle instead. My inner child really digs the two months of Turok love, but as soon as I come to my senses, I'm just so confused. Sure, Turok 2 is one of the most beloved entries in the series, but it's still a console shooter from the 90s. That and the addition of Capitalism 2 just has me completely baffled as to what exactly Humble's trying to accomplish here. However, the addition of great games like Hitman 2, Grease, Raiden 5, and even a solid Humble original with Divinoids really helped to balance things out. If you want to figure out how much your particular picks are worth, here are the retail prices of each game. If you're interested in what Chris and I dropped this month, I dropped Grease as I already owned it, and Capitalism 2 as it goes on sale for as low as $2. If I didn't already own Grease and I didn't have to review Shopkeep 2, I would 100% drop Shopkeep 2, because I hate that game, and I'm a little upset that some of my money has gone to that developer twice now. As for what I'd choose to drop this month, I'd have to go with Capitalism 2 as well as Shopkeep 2, online super turbo, co-op, open world, first person, hyper remix, resource management, RPG, arcade edition. I really like sim games, but Capitalism came out almost 20 years ago, and as for Shopkeep 2, well, I think Austin summed that one up pretty well. Finally, a huge thank you to Michael Slater and all of our patrons over on Patreon. Your support means the world to us. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe out there.